By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to talk about old school budget magic. <laughs> because uh, a lot of players that play magic think that old school magic is only something if you already have the cards or if you're very rich. Well, actually, that's not the case. You can start playing old school magic today. Now, uh, I'm going to show you two budget decks and I'm going to explain them to you and I'm going to talk price a little bit and I'm also going to show you the actual games. Now, if you'd like to go straight to the actual magic itself, you can check out the description below and I've added some timestamps for you. So you can click on the timestamps and it'll take you directly to game one, game two and so forth. But if you'd like to see um, some more information about the actual decks, then, you know, stay with me because I'm now going to discuss both the decks one at a time. I'm going to discuss cards and I'm going to discuss prices. Let's first talk about the deck that I am playing with today and that is a um, aggro blue budget build. And here you can see the picture of the actual deck. And as you can see, it has eight one drops. So that's the Merfolk of the Pearl Trident and the Flying Man. So the chances that I have a creature turn one are, uh, are pretty high. So that's great. That's what I want to do. Um, in a, a best case scenario, I'll have a follow-up play with a Lord of Atlantis, obviously pumping my Merfolk there. I'm playing with a full play set of those. I think they're just fantastic creatures. And I also have uh, four Surrendip Freets, and this is the Italian white border version. And this is actually the most expensive card in this deck, because the, um, here in Amsterdam, in Europe, uh, you pay about 15 euros for one of these. But you can also uh, go really budget and you can get the revised version. So that's like the famous misprint. Then you get like the green card that shows the if biff freet. But it's completely playable, it's functional, it's allowed in uh, many tournaments and in many different uh, rule sets, old school rule sets, for instance, Eternal Central and Atlantic and Ravenna. So you can play it in most old school tournaments. And I believe the revised version is somewhere between two and the three um, euro. So I, I can't imagine that they're very expensive uh, in the States. Now you also see some other cards here. As you can see, the, the Flying Man comes from a set called Time Spiral. Uh, and they're, they're pretty cheap uh, when, you, when you buy them from Time Spiral. When you buy them Arabian Night, it's about five euro. When you buy them Time Spiral, I mean, it's about 50 cents, maybe even less. I, I don't really know what I paid for it. And you also see a playset of Psionic Blasts, and they, they come from the same set. Now, the idea with this deck, obviously, is just to play very aggressive. And you can see a full playset of Boomerangs. So the idea with the Boomerang is that if somebody plays, for instance, a Moat, or uh, they play an Abyss, or they simply play a huge blocker, um, you can play the Boomerang to kind of get rid of those creatures and um, or threats that's not enabling you to attack and you can attack your opponent. So you just want to deal damage with this deck. Every turn you want to deal damage. That is so incredibly important with this deck. If you're not dealing damage in turn two and turn three and turn four, then you're probably going to lose. Now, an interesting thing here um, to look at are the two Phantasmal Terrains. So they work together really well with the Lord of Atlantis because Lord of Atlantis gives Island Walk to the other lords and also to the merfolks. So if you can use your Phantasmal Terrain to give him an island, it's great. Another benefit of Phantasmal Terrain is that it can also take out a Library of Alexandria. It can also take out a Mishra's Factory because it simply changes a land into a basic land of your choice. So in this deck, I'm also playing it because of the land removal ability. So not just to make islands. There is a one-off of a control magic. This kind of has the same purpose as the boomerang. Uh, when my opponent plays a creature that I cannot deal with, I use the control magic and then my opponent is open again to take in the damage. So the control magic, obviously a lot of people are playing with enchantment removal. So I'm not assuming that the control magic will stick around for long, but if I can use it to just get some blockers out of the way and I can keep pressure on my opponent, that's basically what I wanna do. Now, there's also a one-off Sunken City in this deck. Now, I think Sunken City is a little bit underplayed personally because you play two blue and what it does, it gives all your blue creatures plus one, plus one. So it's basically a plus one, plus one at sorcery speed. And if you don't want to play, pay the two blue mana next turn, because yeah, you can decide if you want to or not, it simply uh, buries itself. So it's not like you get damage or anything. You can just decide not to pay the cost and it goes. So the way I play it is really as a sorcery pump spell for plus one, plus one. And hey, when it's useful, 
I'll pay the two mana and I'll keep it around. Like late game, I usually have too many blue mana anyway. And then next to it, you see an Italian Brain Geyser. Now, I really enjoy uh, buying foreign edition of cards, wide bordered, because they're cheaper and it's just, I like the language. This, this one says uh, Mentale uh, on it. And um, yeah, it's just nice to have some English uh, or some Italian language on these uh, or from origin English cards. You also have the Surrender Befreed that says Volare. You know, it reminds me of that song. It's nice. I like it. It kind of brings some an international edge to your deck. Um, now, obviously, Brain Geyser is restricted, so that's why there's only one in there. It's it's just a fantastic card to draw late game because with this deck, there's always this danger of running out of fuel you know you've, you've played all your cheap creatures your opponent is still not dead and there you are your hands almost empty and then you want to find a brain geyser now obviously i'm also playing with a full play set of mistress factories again you want to put pressure on your opponent mistress factories are great to do that um so that's that's the whole story it's not complicated i'm also playing with some counter spells because after turn three i start to have uh, mana left. So first I didn't play with counter spells, but later uh, somebody pointed out to me, they said, well, usually like still early game around turn four, turn five, you'll have too many uh, mana to spend. And then you can use your counter spells to kind of protect your creatures and also like counter the big threats that will not allow you to continue attacking. So actually the counter spells are really great in this build but you're not going to use them turn two turn two you're still playing creatures turn three as well but you're going to use them probably turn turn four and and so forth and then there is uh one copy of the the little book the jalum tome and what jalum tome does you pay three and then you tap two and you draw a card and then you discard a card now this this is basically in there to allow me to dump the lands that I don't need. Because sometimes you're just stuck on a land pocket, you have too much land, and the Jalem Tome is then there to just to go through my land and get me creatures, or, or get me side blasts, get me something that I can deal damage to my opponent. That's really my goal. So the Jalem Tome uh, is great to do that. So this is basically the deck, and when you're looking at, the, at this deck, um, if you're not counting in the Surrender Befreeds, because like I said, they're pretty expensive. And if you would buy Surrender Befreeds Revised Edition, this entire deck can be bought for, I would say, 25 euro. I think I think that's doable if, if I'm looking at this list. Maybe maybe 30 euro. So again, this is one of the of these um, uh, budget decks. And you can actually be successful. You can win games in tournaments with this deck. And I'm sure you can even make it better uh, but you, you can win from really pretty good tournament old school magic decks uh, let's take a look at the deck that my opponent is playing with today my opponent is playing a famous deck is playing the urnum geddon deck and actually there's only one armageddon in there so that's quite interesting already that's the first thing i notice another thing i notice is he's playing with two colors he's playing white and green and he's not playing with a dual land Obviously he's not because the cheapest dual land would be a revised savanna and you'd pay about 100 euros at least to get a savanna. So we're talking budget here. So we're not playing with cards that are that expensive. The most expensive card in here is actually a City of Brass from the Chronicles. He's playing with two of those and I believe you pay around 5 euro each for them. So that's the price here in Europe at least. And the nice thing is that he's done some really nice tricks to kind of work around this dual land because he's playing with Two City of Brasses, they can make any color of mana. They do deal one damage every time the, the land gets tapped. And he's playing with four Felwer Stone. Now, four Felwer Stone is, is great in old school because a lot of opponents are playing with dual lands. A lot of opponents are playing with City of Brass. So that means that with Felwer Stone, you can copy the uh, mana that your opponent can produce. So if your opponent has a City of Brass, all of a sudden your Felwer Stone can make any type of mana. And it doesn't even deal damage to you. So it's really a great mana rock to kind of get the, the mana symbols that you need. So it's really great in this deck. And it's also mana ramping. And we also see their Untamed Wilds there in the left top corner. Personally, I think this card is kind of underplayed. It's a card originally from Legends. This is a 4th edition one. It'll cost you about 2 cents to buy. It's 1 green and 2. And you can search up any basic land in your deck and you can put it into play. That's what it does. And so it's basically ramping and it's it's the only card in its kind in old school. 
And like I said, I think it's a bit underplayed. It's a lot better than you might think. Now, for the people that are not familiar with Ernim Gannon, uh, Ernim Gannon is, is a pretty simple build, um, a cool build. I would recommend it if you're starting with old school. It's a great deck to start with. Um, it has a lot of cheap creatures. You can see Savannah Lions there. You can see Lanawar Elves, so they're just cheap one drops. And it has a lot of ramp spells. So it has Lanawar Elf, Soul Ring, Flower Stone. And what they do is they enable you to make more mana in turn two, more mana in turn three. So they will make it possible for you to play an Urnum Jinn or a Sarah Angel quite early in the game. So then you have a big creature on the board and then ideally in turn four or maybe sometimes even in turn three, you want to play an Armageddon taking care of all the land. So all of a sudden you have a big creature on the board, for instance an Urnum Jinn, and your opponent only has a small creature like a Black Knight or something. So then obviously you have the advantage. And then you can, um, further in the game, you can control the board state with your cheap removal because I can tell you that white removal is really top notch. All the, all the major tournament decks in old school, almost all of them play with white removal because you have Disenchant, which is one of the best cards in old school. And you see four of them in this deck, they can remove an enchantment or an artifact. And just having the option between the two is super powerful in old school. You also have four swords to plows here. So that's creature removal for one white. I mean, it's ridiculously good. So with the, only with these eight cards, control cards, uh, removal cards from white, your deck is so powerful. Obviously, you also see a balance in there and a regrowth, uh, the two restricted cards. Now, the nice thing is when you buy reprints of this card, it's, I mean, it's like 50 cent or something. It's so incredibly cheap. Um, for instance, if you look at the Urnum Jin, if you want to buy an Urnum Jin Arabian Nights, you need to pay at least 120 euros. But if you um, buy a reprint Chronicle, I believe it's like 50 cents. So it's a huge difference. So this entire deck that you see here before you, I think it's it's cheaper than the blue deck, definitely, because the blue deck had Lord of Atlantis and Surrender Pafrit. If I look at this deck, I think... Um, the most expensive card is City of Brass, but most of the other cards are even even under a euro. They're like two cents, ten cents, fifty cents. So I would say this this whole deck is max twenty euros, twenty dollars. And if I say twenty dollars, it's probably too much. You probably have money left. So I think for twenty dollars, you can actually get this deck. Personally, um, I would have added some more Ar Armageddon's. Um, but I'm sure that my opponent has his reasons not to. So this is the deck that my opponent is playing. And now let's go to the games and see how they perform. Game number one is about to begin. And let's see what these reprint decks can do. So I'm sitting on the right with blue aggro and my opponent is sitting on the left with Urnum Geddon. And there I go. Great starting for me because I've got a one drop Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. And this is kind of what I like when my opponent is playing City of Brass and just taking damage. So that helps because I just want to kill him as fast as I can. Attacking here with the Merfolk of the Pearl Trident, going to 18, not willing to do the trade, playing a Flying Man. So ideally, I would have played a Lord of Atlantis here, but hey, Flying Man is good enough for me. It's another point, another point of damage on the board here. It's taking another damage from City of Brass and playing Argovian Pixies. Now, don't think I saw that on the original list that we looked at earlier, so I guess he made some changes. But that's fine. Um, attacking here with both of my creatures. He's down to 15 and I'm playing my powerhouse to surrender a freed. And hopefully he can stick to the board. Let's see what's going to happen. Playing another Felwer Stone. And taking a damage here and there's a Swords. Uh, that's too bad for me. Because it would have felt so good to just, you know, deal three damage here. So it's giving me three life, but then he's attacking me straight away with Argovian Pixies and Alana was taking it three life again. So I'm going down to 20, attacking him. He's, he's on 12. And this is not great. I'm not playing anything here. And he's playing an Untamed Wilds. He's missed a few land drops, but because of those Felwer Stones and now the Untamed Wilds, it doesn't really bother him that much. Also because of the Alana else, of course. Attacking now with his um, Argovian Pixies, dealing another two damage. Passing turn. Tap. If first I'm attacking, okay, so I'm not playing anything. It's usually better to first attack and then play your spell second main phase. Playing a Surrender Afrit here. 
and then an island. And I, actually, I'm just slowing down the game here a little bit because this is a huge mistake on my part. I first played a Surrender Perfect and then the island. I should have done it the other way around because with two blue, I can counter. In this case, I don't have a counter spell in hand, but I do have a boomerang in hand. So if I would have played my island first, I could have played a boomerang on my Surrender Perfect, saving it from that Sword Supplies here. So that's a pretty big misplay on my part here. And um, I hope it's not going to cost me the game. Because there's a big difference between having a Surrender Perfect on the table or in your hand or having it removed from the game. Attacking here, playing my little book, so hopefully that can help me to find some more Surrendips and powerful creatures. But my opponent also has a book, the big book, the JDM Tome. And um, that's going to help him, that's going to give him card advantage and it already has started. And because he has those mana rocks, he has enough mana there. And as you can see, I'm using my uh, book exactly the way that I intended to getting rid of those islands in my hand and finding creatures instead. Now playing a Lord of Atlantis, the 2-2 creature. Let's see what's going to happen. Tapping, no tapping, okay. <laughs> okay, it looks like he doesn't really know what he wants to do. Okay, playing a Flower Stone, playing a Soul Ring. And that will enable him to um, to use that uh, that big book without losing too much mana here. But he's not doing it, he's first choosing to play another Untamed Wilds. And this is really nice. I mean, having that book on the table uh, and having so much mana available means that you can just use it without really having to choose between drawing a card or playing a spell. He can now draw a card and play a spell. Taking another damage there from uh, the City of Brass, playing a Regrove and he's taking back a Swords to Plowseers. So that's a good thing to know for me. Using the book again, again dumping a land. Apparently not really finding any creatures here. Attacking, playing another flying man. Okay, so I, maybe I found a flying man. Playing a disenchantment over the book, and this is a hard decision for me because I know he has that Swords to Plowseers. But I'm just really, really liking my book, so I think I'm just gonna keep it. I don't really mind if he takes any of my three creatures away. They're about, you know, equal. I guess he, he's gonna choose the Lord, gonna take care of the Lord of Atlantis here, being the best creature on the board. Interesting, he's actually playing a sword on his own Argovian Pixies, and this can only mean one thing, exactly, balance. When your opponent is, is you know, killing his own creatures and playing white, it's probably a balance. Oh my goodness, a balance. This is pretty brutal because he has a book left, and oh, an Urnum Jin. okay, Urnum Jin, 4-5 power, powerhouse. This is a big problem for me here. Playing my little books and trying to find something to deal with that Urnum Jin. But he also has his card draw engine going. So he's drawing extra cards here as well. Attacking me here for four. And this is going to be very difficult. Let's see what I can do here to get back in this game. I mean, my little book is gone. He has a card draw engine. He has a four or five creature. Another tome there. Okay, I'm on nine life. What can I do? Okay, at least Murfolk of the Pearl Trident. That's a chum blocker, so... That's basically just a four life spell now. I mean, I'm still on nine. I got a couple of turns. And he's attacking me here. Uh, maybe I got a boomerang. That's why I'm doubting to play something. Boomerang wouldn't be too bad right now, I guess. But I'm taking the damage, going to five life. And he's taking a damage as well, playing a Lanora Elves. He's going to eight. And let's see. I mean... The situation looks hopeless, but hey, it's not done yet. Playing a planes, and he's got he's got two books. He's drawing two cards per turn. Playing a Felber Stone, and now he's attacking. Chump blocking his Urnum Jin, and playing a Cyblast. Okay, that's pretty good, and that means I'm on two, and he's on four. So if I get, and there it is. Yes, I found a Cyblast. Really happy with this. Because now I have a draw. Amazing. So I managed to kind of get a draw out of this. And I was I was, I was, was just lost. At least, in, I mean, my chances, I thought, were like below zero. But hey, I got a draw. And actually, when it's a draw, it's, it hasn't really happened before. Uh, we're just going to keep it zero, zero. So game number two is actually going to be game number one. Let's, um, yeah, go to game number two. And it's, uh, it's zero, zero. So let's see what's going to happen next.
Game number two, and because of that draw, um, it's still 0-0. Zero, zero. And I think we're just going to throw the dice to see who gets to start. And uh, yeah, that was a pretty interesting finish there. Being able to uh, at least get a draw out of that game. Let's see what I can do here. I believe I have uh, I can start again here winning the dice roll. And I'm playing a Mishra's Factory turn one. And I'm just going to attack. Unfortunately, that's what always happens. So maybe I shouldn't have done it. But hey, I'm playing an aggressive deck. So I want to play as aggressive as possible. Let's see what I can do. Hopefully I can find a creature. And there's a Flying Man. Passing turn. And also a new Mishra's Factory. Ooh, this is not great. There's an Urnum Gen 4-5. Turn number three here. And because of that Felwer Stone, he can accelerate. And playing the Tome here. The little book, so hopefully I can I can find a solution. But the difficult thing about the Urnum Jin is that it's a 4-5, so a Cyblast doesn't kill it. And he's attacking now, also playing a Sarah Angel, and it's looking really bad here for me. And there you go, playing a Cyblast, so I'm able to get rid of the Angel and at least swing in for one damage. But this is going to be really difficult for me. Tapping five, a bodyguard, cool, okay. And this is actually the German bodyguard here that he's playing. And um, I recommend you all to, to find a picture of the German bodyguard and the name of the, uh, of the bodyguard in German. It's really funny. That's all I'm gonna say, let's look it up. Anyway, it's looking really, really bad for me because I mean, the veteran bodyguard is gonna cancel out the damage that I can deal with my little creatures playing another flying man. And the bodyguard is just going to soak up the damage. For the ones who don't know, Veteran Bodyguard is one of those classic cards. It's, it's 2 white and 3 to cast. And it's a 2-5 creature. And as long as it's untapped, all the damage that is dealt to you is dealt to the bodyguard instead. So it's really nice. It hardly sees any play. And I don't think I saw the Veteran Bodyguard on his list. So I kind of like the little tweaks and changes that my opponent has made in his list. Pretty cool. A German blackboarded veteran bodyguard. Really, really nice. And there I'm using my little book, but I mean, look at the board state. I don't think I can win this one. I'm playing a Murphy of the Pearl Trident and another Flying Man. But these creatures are so small compared to the army that my opponent has. Two Urnum Jins. He also has that factory. He has a 2 5 bodyguard because that 5 toughness is going to be really difficult to kill. Playing a lot of our elves, and I'm on eight, so I have to start blocking stuff. And I think he's, yeah, he's attacking here. At least not with the bodyguard. That's something. So he's attacking. I'm chum blocking with one Murfolk of the Pearl Trident. I'm on two life. Ay, 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 ay. Uh, what can I do? I need a board wipe, but I don't have a board wipe because I'm playing mono blue. Okay, playing a Lord of Atlantis. That's a little too late. I just I just chump luck with my Pearl Trident. My opponent is untapping here. Look at that army. And this is killing. Activating and attacking here. And I have to block. So I'm choosing to... Oh, and there's a disenchant. I wanted to say I'm choosing to animate my factory and double block on, on the Lord with with the lord and a uh, mistress factory instead i'm not just sacking all my flying man using them as jump blockers i mean i'm still alive but that's about it i don't think i have a, a chance here and i'm killing myself yeah what else can i do so playing the side blast killing myself here and that is game number two so i guess this is the first point for the urnum gennadex so i'm behind here and uh, we have to go to game number three. And let's see if I can uh, can get a victory there. Game number three is about to begin. So, yeah, I, that was... Yeah, I got pretty beat up in, uh, in game two. So, so far my deck seems to kind of lack big creatures. You know, dealing with creatures like the Urnum Jin and the Sarah Angel is just a little bit too much for me with my uh, little weenie creatures. 
I'm just gonna try again, and hopefully I can I can finally find a second turn Lord of Atlantis here. I guess I didn't, or else I would have played it. And playing another Merfolk and playing a Flying Man. Okay, so I've got a nice 1-1 one -one army here. Let's see what my opponent can do. Playing a Felwer Stone, passing turns. It is ideal for me being able to at least deal some more damage. And there's a Sunken City. This is great. And now I can deal 6 damage. And I talked about Sunken City in the introduction. I really think it's an underestimated card. And look at what it does now. And this is, this is a pretty good play for my opponent, using the strip mine to take care of one of my islands. And that means that I cannot pay the upkeep cost for the Sunken City. So unfortunately for me, it's going to go, but at least I had a 6 damage swing with the Sunken City. So I'm quite happy with that, actually. And there's a Swords over my Flying Man, so that means only 2 damage left. Playing another Merfolk, but there's not a second island. So this is not great. And here playing a Sarah Angel. What can I do here? Playing a Boomerang over the Sarah Angel. So this is exactly what I want to do. Being able to deal 3 damage here. And he's already on 8. So that means if I can find some Psy Blasts, I've basically won this game. But that's easier said than done. Playing land number 3 here. And playing a Psy Blast on the Angel. Because that means that I can attack with my Merfolks here. And he's on 5 and he's only on 5, so it's going to be really difficult for him to kind of win. And wow, look at that, playing another Sarah Angel and an Argovian Pixies. Tapping 2, what can I do? Playing a Lord of Atlantis, this is great, and I'm just attacking. That means I'm losing 2 Merfolk, but he's also losing one of his blockers. Only has that Angel left, and let's hope that he cannot play out another Fatty here. He's only on 3, I've got 3 creatures there basically on the board, because I can animate by Mishra's Factory. He's playing a regrowth. Oh, killing my Lord of Atlantis. And there are just a lot of weapons that my opponent has. And look at this. Am I seriously going to lose this now? Please give me a side blast. Rearranging my cards here, and I have to pass turn. There's nothing I can do. I'm still on 17, so I have some time here to try to find a solution. Playing an Armageddon, oh, luckily I got a Counterspell. Oh, I think if that Armageddon would have resolved, it would have been end game and match. Because remember, I have to win this one uh, to get a game four out of this. Drawing a card here. Playing a Flying Man. So that's not too bad. It's still taking damage. It's not, I'm not doing great, but hey. Trying to build an army. Okay, this this maybe this can push my luck here. Taking a damage, going to eight. I mean a boomerang would be enough here. If I can boomerang the Sarah Angel. Or if I can get a side blast. So I got I got some outs here. But the surrender profit obviously is also a problem because it's it's slowly killing me. I'm on seven now. Having to pass turn again. This is pretty frustrating. I'm on six. Playing an island. And there it goes. There's my Italian brain geyser drawing two cards here. Hopefully I can find something. But I'm I mean I'm giving my opponent opportunities as well, you know. Because if he finds another blocker, it's another problem. So I guess it's my turn again, so I'm going to go to 5 here. Playing another island, tapping for 3. Okay, another Surrendip. Okay, so this is looking good. So if I can keep this board state next turn, I've won the game. It's dangerous because, I mean, I'm now getting 2 damage during my upkeep, only on 5 life. I'm playing a Surrendip Jin, and I'm playing a Counterspell over the Surrendip Jin, and, and it looks like it's game. But he still has a lot of untapped lands and, and, and some cards in hand. So now he's attacking. And I decide to chump block an elf and double block. Oh, he actually attacked with everything here. Interesting. So I'm down to four. 
And I guess this was kind of a last stand thing from his uh, from his side. So I've won this one. Great. Okay. I almost thought I was going to lose it. Um, so I've won this one. So we're going to go to game um, number four. And, and let's see who, who wins this, this crazy reprint battle. Game number four is about to begin. It's 1-1. One, one. And I mean, after the draw, it means we've played three games. This is number four. And I really... I really want to win this one, having put so much energy in it, but um, I must say, I, I kind of feel like his deck is stronger, to be honest. And maybe I need to add some unstable mutations in my build, kind of to pump my creatures. If you have any suggestions how to improve my deck, let me know. And I guess I'm taking a mulligan here, I had no blue mana. Maybe add air elementals a little bit later in the game. It is difficult. Phantasmal Forces maybe, it's a 4-1. It's another one of those cards that I really like. I really enjoy the art. I, I understand it doesn't see a lot of play, but I really like the art and it has, I mean, it has four power. Uh, okay, but let's have a look at the game. A good start here by my opponent. Actually, we both have one drops here. It's a Venna Lines. And a flying man. So there goes the flying man with the swords, and that's two damage that I'm taking in here with the uh, by the Savannah Alliance. Playing my second blue, playing a phantasmal terrain, and I'm targeting, I believe, his planes. And the reason I'm doing this is because his planes give him access to swords to plowsiers and disenchants. What can my opponent do here? Playing two for a Felwer Stone, playing a city of brass, taking a damage here. And there you go, a disenchant. So I couldn't enjoy that phantasmal terrain for a long time, but at least it's uh, it soaks up a disenchant, I guess. And here I go playing a surrender of free. So that's a three four. And there you go. That sword supplies here is just such an amazing card, and and it, it has done so much for my opponent. Especially when you compare it with me playing with blue. I mean, I can counter spells, but that's about it. Or I can send them back to his hand. But I, it's, I'm having a really tough time removing it. Especially those um, those Urnum Jins with the 5 toughness. So he's swinging in here. I'm on 15. Things are not looking good for me. Playing a Flying Man. I'm playing a Sunken City. Okay, at least that's something. Now I've got a 2-2 two -two Flyer. Attacking me here. Am I going to trade? Okay, I am actually, and it kind of surprises me, to be honest. But I am making the trade. Does mean I'm open. Keeping the Sunken City around, playing my second blue. I don't think I had much going for me in my hand at this time. Paying the two upkeep again, playing Island number three. And he's playing another Felwer Stone, attacking me here, going to 13. Playing island number four, and I believe I'm just only drawing islands at this point in the game. And he's playing an Argovian Pixies, and that just means two extra damage for me, so that's a big problem. I'm on 12 already. And there is the book, so hopefully that can help me. And he's attacking with both, so I'm going to 9 under 10 now. So more than half of my life is gone at this point in the game. And look at that, he's tapping a lot of mana. <laughs> oh, and here we go, the German bodyguard again. <laughs> Seriously, look it up. Look it up. It's fantastic. I tried to find a picture, uh, but I couldn't find a good one to add to this um, to this clip, or else I would have done it to this match. And there I go, at least playing a Murfolk of the Pearl Trident, and it at least gives me a 2-2 body. There he goes. He's attacking. Am I going to trade? That's the question. Am I just going to take four damage? But then I'm already on five life. I mean, this is really difficult for me. Chum blocking here, I guess. So taking the two damage from the veteran. Using my book, but because I'm paying the upkeep cost. I'm doing it end step. Using my book end step, okay. Playing a Surrendip Afrit here. A 3-4, at least that's a blocker for the Veteran Bodyguard and a blocker for everything else he has on the table. And I'm kind of lucky that my opponent is not really finding anything. 
And what am I going to do here? Am I going to block a Lana War and then taking more damage, or am I going to block the Veteran? Now, remember, my Surrender Perfeed is a 4 5 because of the Sunken City. I'm just taking all the damage. I guess I'm afraid of. This is an interesting move. I guess I'm afraid of a Giant Growth. Now, remember, this game has been going on for a while, so, I mean, we're not that fresh anymore. But this is a weird move on my part, because I haven't seen a single Giant Growth in all these games, so why not just block it? And playing a Boomerang now. And he's recasting his Veteran. And look at this, playing Counter Spell. So this is a nice combo. It does take me two cards. But it does take care of the Veteran Bodyguard. So I'm using the Boomerang to send it back, and then he has to cast it again in his second main phase, and then I'm playing a Counter Spell. Attacking him now for four. And I'm, I mean, I'm on two life. It's not great, but my opponent does not have direct damage. At least he doesn't have that. Look at that, he's playing a balance. And he's actually saving my life now with this balance play. Oh my god, he's saving me. Playing a balance. And look, I had Psy Blast in my hand that I cannot cast because my life total is too low. And he's playing his balance. That means that I can get rid of my Surrender Perfreed. And if he would have just done nothing, uh, I would have died in two turns. But he's saving my ass. So let's see if I can still win this game. Interesting. I was thinking about a another draw game scenario with the Psy Blasts. But we'll see how this works. Playing a Phantasmal Terrain, so that takes care of his Mishra's Factory here, so that's great for me. I mean, I'm still only on two life. And hopefully I can find some Merfolk here. Yes, look at that, two Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. Now remember, my Lord of Atlantis is giving them an Island Walk, and he has an Island. And look at that flavor, I've got the Sunken City... And uh, I've got a lot of merfolk here. So I can do two damage with the Island Walker. It's unblockable. And this is basically the dream when you're playing merfolk. You're playing Sunken City and your Lord of Atlantis is the mayor of the Sunken City. What? I was just having this disenchant on Sunken City. Oh, man. How can you disenchant a Sunken City? Anyway, Sunken City is gone. Playing a Flying Man here. But it looks like I've got the upper hand. Ooh, and there's a counter spell on that Urnum Jin. That was very important here. He's only on seven, so am I actually going to win this one? Remember, if he wouldn't have played that balance, I would have been long dead by now. So this is nice. Playing a control magic over one of the Lanawars, simply doing that. I think so I can kill him this turn, but I don't think I can actually. Because I have seven on the board, he can chump block one. He has to, that's why I'm attacking with everything here. And it means that I can deal 5 damage and he's going to 2 life here. Let's see. No, that's it! Okay, thank you for playing that balance. Yes, yes, very happy here. I I don't think that my, my blue aggro deck um, is the better deck. But hey, I've at least I've won this matchup. Um, would you add unstable mutations? Let me know. And what would you take out, more importantly? Because that's always the hardest part. Maybe those four boomerangs. Maybe the counter spells. Uh, maybe one of both. Let me know in the comments below. Um, thank you for watching this episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you'd like to see more games, you can click on the videos that are appearing right now on the screen. Uh, if you're not a member yet, please subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to get to 1,000 as fast as possible. Um, and I think we're now around six, 700. Uh, for now, thank you for watching this episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And see you next time.